Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Our Father's Word. Fantastic. That's all that can be said for it. The book of Proverbs, a book of comparisons, giving you the good and the bad, the path you choose. This is what it comes down to on Judgment Day. You're judged by your decisions, not somebody else's, and you're judged by what's in the book of life. And as we discovered in the last chapter with wisdom speaking, she mentioned the tree of life, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you want to make sure that you listen to wisdom, for it will, wisdom will lead you to him. Chapter 5, verse 1, that word of wisdom from our Father. And we'd have to title this chapter, The Foreign Woman. Okay, chapter 5, verse 1. My son, attend unto my wisdom and bowed thine ear to my understanding. That means you, in another place it would say, let your ears point. That means as an animal, when they hear a noise, their ears point forward and, and uh, they focus on something. What he's saying is, is let your ear focus on my word and gain understanding. It's that simple. Never make God's word complicated. For God is more natural, meaning it's just natural. And when you understand the natural thing, then it will fall in place for you. So you open your mind and attend to his wisdom. Lock it away in your mind. It's precious. Verse 2, that thou mayest regard discretion, and that thy lips may keep knowledge, um, that... um, your, your lips will keep knowledge in as much as you know when for the lips to speak and when not to. You have discretion, meaning common sense. And um, here, there, there are times to speak and there's times not to speak. And ultimately, it comes down, don't cast your pearls before swine. Okay. God's words, oftentimes, when he likens it to secrets, It's just that some people don't have eyes to see or ears to hear. It doesn't matter how simple it is. They're not going to see it. And there's nothing, you you can find someone that doesn't have eyes to see or ears to hear, and you can plant all the seeds you want to. You can cast all the pearls you want before them. They're not going to get it, okay? Because Father has basically blinded them, as it is written in uh, Romans chapter 11. So make sure you know and get the discretion and the wisdom to know when to speak and when to not speak. Verse 3, For the lips of a strange woman drop as an honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Oh, I mean, she can sure sweet talk, okay? But I'm going to tell you something. You're going to have to learn the difference in the word foreign and stranger here in this chapter, or you're never going to understand it. The woman we're just speaking of here is Azur. And Azur is um, an Israelite or a Christian woman that um, has been, has gone to apostasy. In other words, has moved over into worshiping traditions of men more than the word of God. They can seem to be very holy, but and, and this is what makes them dangerous. They'll call their name by the Lord Messiah. They'll say, I follow him, I'm this, I'm that, but they're an apostate. And you ha- this is why wisdom is ever so important, that you can, aspo- you can spot the apostate. Now, the other stranger that will be mentioned here is Nacar in the Hebrew tongue, and it literally means a foreign woman, and this has to do with spirituality or that in a moral sense, 
And basically that foreign woman is where the Kenite comes in and also the old harlot mystery Babylon is both in the Zur and the Nacar. I will call your attention as to, from the manuscripts as to who we're talking about. The one just mentioned, a Zur. Okay, that means an apostate. Claims to be the same thing you are, basically. But she's not. It's religion. Be real careful. Religion may call itself serving the Lord Christ. It may seem holier than thou. But don't be deceived. Take God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Do not listen to the traditions of men that make void the word of God. I'm telling you, it can be like a honeycomb dropping, smoother than silk. They make it, they can bundle it up, the traditions of men, until they, and they'll swear by it. And yet, you won't find it in God's word. And that makes it apostate. In this generation, you must especially take this serious because you live in the generation of the great apostasy. That's, apostasy is a Greek word that means changing one's uh, religion from one thing to another and sometimes instantly, especially when the false Christ appears, okay? So um, there you have it. Remember those names and I'll call it to your attention as we go. What does it say about this one that claims to be like in your church? But what does she say? Verse 4, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Now, if you're familiar at all with Revelation chapter 8, verse 10, where it states there, I saw beheld a, fire, a star fall from heaven, and his name was Wormwood. That was Satan. We know that. So we, we know who she's following, basically. She's setting herself up for the false Christ. That's who Wormwood is. So it goes without saying. You know, wisdom prevails, and, and uh, it's a simple thing for you to understand Wormwood. If you've ever read Revelation 8.10, that's who she follows, apostasy. Verse 5. Her feet go down to death. That's her path, okay? Her steps take hold on hell. In other words, her, her lies and her religion, though it may be sweet as a honeycomb, it takes you down that slippery slope all the way to deception, to a wormwood himself. That's to say the devil. Okay. Verse 6. Lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life, her ways are movable. They're not solid. Changey, changey. That thou canst not know them. Her ways are unstable and she doesn't even know it. So these religionists will change their mind every time the wind changes direction and, uh, and shouts and goes on and praises God, but what? What God? Okay. You have to, you know, a teacher teaches God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. That's God's word. But one of these people that claim to be a teacher and will read you half a verse from God's word and then pop air for a, a, an hour or a half, uh, that's not God's word. That's traditions of men, basically. And I'm not judging it doesn't, you don't have to have too much wisdom to figure that one out. And she doesn't even know it. And you know, the strange thing, you can go to that congregation and they'll come out and they'll say, wasn't that wonderful? Well, what did you learn from God's word? And they'll say, huh? I don't know. Well, th that's a sad time to not have knowledge. It's when you just walk out of a church building. Verse 7. Hear me now, therefore, you listen up, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. You, these sayings that I have, this wisdom, you listen to it. You pay attention to this word, God's word, not man's. Not this man or any other man. You listen to your heavenly Father. Verse 8. Remove thy way far from her. 
that's to say this apostate, and come not nigh the door of her house, don't you even go in that house. It may call itself the very center of God's orbit. That doesn't make it so. What it's telling you, if God's word is not taught there, don't go. Now, the beauty of it is that one well-founded in the scripture of God can go anywhere. And you're not going to be swayed by nonsense or trivia. You're not going to be swayed by the traditions of men because you have locked in your forehead wisdom from God's word, which is called the seal of God, Revelation chapter 9, verse 4. You can go anywhere and never fear for a second. But for a person that's weak, that door of the apostate is a dangerous thing. They could be taken in by it down that slippery slope, that decline that ends up in death, which is one of Satan's names. What a fantastic word our father has. Stay out of that house, the house of the apostate. Well, say again what that means. It means where God's word is not taught chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Verse 9, lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years unto the cruel, lest you fall for her temptation, lest you fall for the honeycomb that drips from her mouth. Okay. We're talking here about old sister Babylon of the end times. Don't be taken in by her. She rides that old beast system, which is to say Satan's own little trumped up mess. Verse 10, lest, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, that's to say your strength, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. Now here you have both those words. You have uh, zer, lest the zer be filled with your strength, that's to say the apostate, and, some, and the labors be in the house of a stranger, that's to say a foreigner. Uh, the Kenite, okay, in part. You know, Father's Word, many might say, well, well, how would I ever know that? Well, if you have a simple Strong's Concordance, which I request that you have, you can find this out, which is Zer and which is Nacar. Okay. It's no big deal. It's really quite simple. Because when, when we start talking about apostasy, you want that to grab your attention. Because you do, do not want to be sucked in by that, made the fool of, and robbed actually where your wealth, which is your strength, Almighty God, you are robbed by nonsense. And here you have both, as I stated, lest strangers, that would be lest the apostate, the harlot, be filled with your strength and your wealth, and thy labors be in the house of a stranger, that's to say, a foreigner like the Kenite, not even of your house. Verse 11, And thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. You lose it. I mean, lose everything. That's why this is very serious, and that's why you want to attain and listen to the word of God. Okay. Verse 12, And say, how have I hated instructions? How, how have I hated guidance? And my heart despiseth reproof. Uh, in other words, I didn't accept the warning. I didn't listen. The warning is there, my friend, and you're in that generation. You want to get your ears on the point. You want to stay focused on the Word of God because that apostasy works overtime in this generation. I mean, it comes under many names. Well, how do I tell the difference? Whether they teach God's word or not. That's really quite simple, isn't it? You don't have to be too wise to know. Are you studying chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby it is the letter that God has sent to you? Or are you listening to smoke? Okay. This doesn't take a bright person to figure that one out. Verse 13. And have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, 
nor incline mine ear to them that instructed me. Well, which teacher does he want me to listen to? I've listened to this teacher and that teacher. To what teachers teach the word of God? Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the minor prophets, Luke, Matthew, Mark, John, and Paul. Those are the teachers that bring forth the word of God, not man. That's the teachers you want to listen to, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. The very word of Moses, as he brought through the wilderness, setting the example, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be at the end. Do you know that? Do you even know what happened in the beginning? Or I'll even rephrase that. Do you, with wisdom, even know when the beginning was? Did you know of the first earth age? If you didn't, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. For there was an earth age before this one. Do you know what happened there? Well, then you haven't listened to the teachers, for they tell you. Chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Well, do you know something? Some might say, well, that sounds complicated. It isn't. In the simplicity in which Christ brings forth the word in a very natural way. Stay focused on the word of God and let the traditions of men that make it void fall by the wayside. Stay focused on the wisdom of God. Wisdom speaks. You listen to her. <clears throat> it isn't difficult to know which um, teachers to follow for wisdom follows those teachers. Why? Because it really wasn't their words. It was the word of God. Verse 14 to continue. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. I, 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 was, I was just about ready to face disgrace. You could even translate it, or I was almost sentenced to death. If you listen to that garbage... To be misled. To, to not even be taught about the false Christ coming at the sixth trump and the true Christ not returning until the seventh. That simple order of events that is so well illustrated in the word of God in the simplicity brought forth by the Holy Spirit in that great book of Revelation which means to reveal or to make known. Have you read it? Do you know it? Has it been revealed to you? That's what the title means. Surely you can understand it. Surely you haven't listened to one of these knuckleheads that would say, you're not supposed to understand Revelation. You're going to be gone. That's a lie. And you've listened to false teachers. Just making friends and influencing people, but your soul depends on this. Do you listen to the word of God or do you listen to man? That's up to you. What you do goes in the book of life, and that's what you're judged by. Entirely up to you. Make sure that you're not one of those that's almost disgraced or embarrassed before Almighty God. Verse 15. Drink waters out of thine own cistern, and running waters out of thine own well. That's to say fresh water. Cistern is a dug a well that water is placed in to keep and uh, running waters is a, a dug well. In other words, if you be Christian, you know what water it is that we're to partake of. You know who the living waters are belong to by the, to the Lord Jesus Christ. You partake of that water and you'll never thirst again. And, and um, don't go drinking water out of somebody else's well. Okay. And, and that means our living water is Jesus Christ. What is theirs? You don't need another. You have the Savior. So stick, don't be movable. Don't have that movable path that listens to this person 30 minutes and somebody else Changey, 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 stick to the word of God. Listen to the teachers God has sent. That's to say, the, Solomon, the writer of these Proverbs, he that brought forth wisdom at the hand of God. Verse 16, 
Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the street. I cannot let that stand, okay, because it's a mistranslation. I rarely ever do this to you. I usually teach it as the King James has it and make the correction without even calling it to your attention. But the Septuagint, which comes from an older text than even this King James comes from, does not have it worded that way. What it says is, let not. In other words, you've got to insert the word not, and you might as well write it in and pencil it in the side column of your manuscripts. Let not the fountains, let not thy fountains be dispersed abroad in rivers of waters in the streets. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Okay. The next verse will clear it up for you. Verse 17, let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. That's to say zur, not for the apostates. The zur means apostates. Don't forget it. Don't, don't let um, the clear water be wasted before the apostates. There's one thing to plant seeds. It's another to just spew forth real truth in the streets where you have nothing but apostates that are never going to hear any good for it. This is when you know when to open the lips and when not to. Okay, That's what his caution is here. And in the New Testament, we're encouraged, don't cast your pearls before swine. And so it is. That's someone that has an unclean mind, meaning do not have the clarity of the word of God. That's to say a zhe, an apostate, one that claims or thinks they are Christian and falls far short of the mark of understanding God's word. I'll read that verse 17 again. Let them be only thine own and not strangers zur with thee. You want to watch that. Verse 18. Let thy fountain be blessed. That's where the big difference. You want God to bless your fountain? Then you better listen to him. And rejoice with the wife of thy youth. And naturally, you are told in the great book of Revelation in chapter 2, that um, one of the church's its main uh, sin was it left its first love, which is to say Messiah. So um, you, you want to stick with the true Messiah. You know, we can take this on the other hand as the gift of God to man. The greatest gift God gave man is his wife. And, and um, that, uh, she is precious. And that's what it's talking about here. Verse 19, Let her be as the loving hind in pleasant row. Let her breast satisfy thee all times, and be, thy ravished al and be thou ravished always with her love. In other words, let that love grow. And so it is, and so it happens. Okay. Uh, you can see Solomon writing this, and it should remind you of the greatest love story ever told, the so Song of Solomon. Okay, and, and it is, truly is a beautiful thing. It has to do with Christ and his bride. And that's what it's speaking of here. And at the same time, you should love your family, and you should take care of your family. And, uh, well, what is he talking about? Don't expose your family to the zur. If you allow the zur, or you take your family to that house of the zur, the apostate, you're asking for trouble. Your children might just abandon you and go with the apostate. It could happen. We're talking about a very serious subject here, beloved. Family is family. Love is love. Our first love is our Heavenly Father and the Son that He sent gave his life for us. And that great wedding that is about to take place, do you have on a wedding garment? You don't want to be the old harlot chasing around after the apostasy. You don't want to be the old harlot chasing around after wormwood. 
talk about a death sentence and talk about disgrace. It can happen. Verse 20 to continue. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman? That's an apostate, Zer. And embrace the bosom of a stranger. That's Nikar, the Kenite. Why would you let the world deceive you that way that you wouldn't know one from the other? You know, you may not take this too serious, but you should. For within this is entailed the key of David. To know who you should follow, the true Christ, who is of David, or you may end up with the false, and that is a straight ticket to hell. Okay. That is disgrace, embarrassment, shame. And the important thing is if you want, like if you let thy fountain be blessed, do you want God to bless the very fountain of your life, your soul, your mind through which this wisdom comes forth? is embedded there and shared with those that deserve to hear it, that plant seeds the, that God blesses and it grows and strengthens that family of yours whereby it holds together, then that's what he's talking about. Don't let the Zer or the Nacar tear up your family. It'll have you fighting tooth and nail among yourselves. And you just let the devil have his way with your family. And you become a part of it, regardless of how close you try to follow. If you embed in this, if you uh, allow yourself to be drawn into that same thing, then there you go, okay? Deceived again. Be careful, my friend. Know the difference between the apostate and the Kenite, uh, especially in these end times. Extremely, extremely important. Verse 21. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. Your ways are observed. The eyes of the Lord see you, observe you, take note. Goes down in the book of life, my friend, as I have warned you. And and uh, the Lord ponders all his goings. He, in other words, he observes where you go. This is why, well, you might say, well, well, how could I believe that? Well, if you, how do you think he knows who to bless and who not to bless? Do you think he just hands out blessings by shuffling the deck? That would be ridiculous. Father doesn't operate that way. He has his eyes up on his anointed and he follows them and ponders. And he knows when you need help. And he passes out those blessings to those that own it. You were taught that before in these same parables. Proverbs. Be sure and give just due to those that deserve it. God knows who deserves it. And he certainly follows his own word and his own law and his own wisdom. He knows whom to bless and whom not to bless. Pondereth means he meditates on it even. What? Why? Well, he loves you. That's the reason. Verse 22. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. These, these cords of his sins, he weaves his own web. In his own web, entraps him. He's caught in it. We studied that also in Proverbs that how a man as a dumb bird sees the net and flies right into it. He weaves his own net and drops into it. That's what wickedness will do for you. You see, if you don't know an apostate when you hear one, and if you don't know an acar when you hear one, and many might say, well, that sounds very difficult. No, it isn't. Zer simply means an apostate. That means somebody that teaches different than God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. It means somebody that claims to be bringing forth God's word, but they never quite quote God. 
who are they quoting then? You know, you don't, you don't have to be the brightest bulb in the uh, cabinet to figure that one out. Many um, illusionists have gone out into the world to make appear what doesn't appear, to appear to be something they're not. You know, Jesus thought enough of this that in Mark chapter 13 and in Matthew 24, he even told you the first warning, beware of those that come in my name, do not be deceived. In other words, that claim to be of Christ, that claim to be of God. He says, I didn't send them. So you want to learn how to test the fruit. If you see an apple growing on an orange tree, that's not natural. And if you see somebody that claims to be a preacher, regardless of what garb he wears, and he's spewing forth something other than God's word, he's not a preacher from our Father. Verse 23 to complete the chapter. He shall die without instructions and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. Do you know that to go astray is the same word as zur basically? That's what a zur does. They go astray. They go into apostasy. They go into false teachings. What a way to complete the chapter. And probably one of the greatest chapters in God's Word follows this in chapter 6. Wisdom calls. It's going to take you back into the first earth age even. It's a fantastic chapter. Don't miss the next lecture. It, it is a breath of fresh air in a cruel world where many mis try to mislead. I, I'm not going to say they try to mislead. As, as I stated earlier, they're, they um, um, they don't even realize they're on the wrong path because it's so holy. It's like a honeycomb. It's so sweet. If it's not of God, it's not sweet. It's bitter. So take the true word of God and let it be sweet in your mouth and maybe a little bitter to the tummy because of the wickedness that's in the world, but no truth, no wisdom. Lock it up here and wear it well. And you will always learn discernment between Zur and Nacar, between an apostate and a son of Cain. You'll know the difference. You'll know and recognize the action. All right, hey, whatever you do, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you please? The book of Ezekiel. What a fantastic study, this book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel that covers, if you would, those vehicles, those circular discs. In the Hebrew, it states very clearly that that whirlwind with the color amber traced back to the Hebrew, highly polished bronze. What an exciting thing that God's Word informs us on all things. Ezekiel, one of my favorite prophets of the Bible, Probably more written, not probably, but absolutely more written on what will happen in the millennium age than even the book of Revelation. Ezekiel guiding you through it, what God will expect at the final battle, Armageddon and Haman Gog, recorded in this great prophecy. I know you're going to enjoy it, the book of Ezekiel. All right, and there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, hey, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, share it with us. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular Zur or Nacar. That is to say, individual, some reverend or some denomination or some uh, religion. Let's don't judge people. God is the judge. Just because we teach the Word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse, you may think we're judging. It's not us. It's God. It's our Heavenly Father. And He is the judge of judges. He does not need our help or yours. To judge is a great sin. You are to discern who to stay away with, when to speak, when not to speak. 
and with the Holy Spirit directing. What a, what a fantastic world we live in. Those of you that listen by shortwave, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address all the way around the world. It's such a pleasure hearing from you and studying God's Word. Now, got a prayer request. You don't need the number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. Did you not read today? He said, he, his eyes are upon his own, and he ponders their very moods. He helps them. He watches over them. He's got time for you. He loves you. He even knows what you're thinking. He can read your mind. In the Greek, he's called the cardionor. Okay? He knows what your heart thinks, which is your mind. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and questions. We're going to go with Heather from um, Arkansas. If we are married on earth, will we still be together in heaven? And if we are, what happens if we remarry after our first mate passes? Well, it's, there is no marriage of that respect in heaven. But as far as knowing each other, recognizing each other, sure. But uh, the wedding is with the Almighty God, okay? the Lord Jesus Christ, I should say. Adriath from Iowa. My question is, you stated we need to follow the solar calendar because we are children of light, not of the dark, at um, a, a moon calendar. We are farmers and we're taught to plant and wean by our baby animals according to the signs of the moon. The baby animals don't cry for mama so much and so forth if we follow this. Is this wrong to do? No, no, no. Uh, that's why God placed the sun, the moon, and the stars is for signs. Okay. He expects us to use them. But we ourselves are children of light. Okay. And uh, we are to follow the sun. But the moon is there for us for signs. As a matter of fact, you need to be very familiar with it because... Every prophecy that has to do with Satan is given in months, not years, not days. Every prophecy given concerning the two witnesses or God's elect is in days, daylight. Okay. Every prophecy of Satan is in moons. I'll give you an example. Chapter 11, Revelation, the two witnesses will have 1,260 days. Revelation chapter 12, verse 4 the dragon, that old devil, will reign for 42 months. Both the same period of time, but one in darkness and the other in light. That's why it's very important. But no, uh, I also um, understand the signs for planting, weaning, castorating, and so forth. We're talking about animals now, of course. Okay, um, Seth from Pennsylvania. If a couple is married by a woman preacher, minister, will God recognize this union? Well, hey, when two people marry, their vows are between themselves and God, not the preacher. The preacher doesn't have anything to do with the union. Okay, The, the vows are made before between the husband and the wife and Almighty God. Uh, they certainly don't take the preacher into their marriage, okay? He's got nothing to do with their marriage. So uh, I think that answers your question. Uh, Col Colleen from Arkansas. Colleen, you are right, okay? I, you have to use your own judgment, but the Holy Spirit is speaking to you in a very correct way. And you need to stick with what you know is right, okay? Gloria from Virginia. Would you please talk about the wickedness of mankind in Genesis chapter 6, verse 2, 8? Are the sons of God angels who left heaven with Lucifer and came to earth and mated with the daughters of men? The daughters of Adam, not men. Adam, eth ha Adam, okay? And is that one of the reasons why God chose to destroy the earth? Well, he destroyed those people, not the earth itself, okay? The earth destruction came in the first earth age. He simply destroyed the people that 
uh, he, he made the fallen angels return home and he destroyed all those that did not have a clear pedigree, meaning hybrids. And the only family that was left genuine with perfect generations was Noah, his wife, and his sons and their wives. They were all perfect, and he took them. This is my first time watching you, and I've enjoyed listening to you, and I pray that you answer. Well, I, I hope that answers you, but you are correct, and that is what happened. This is why the fallen angels, called Nephilim in the Hebrew tongue, Napa from fallen. You can read of them again in the great book of Jude, where their sin was they left their first habitation. Or you can read in the uh, great St. John, chapter 3, where John is teaching, or Christ is teaching in, in John's uh, um, book, that you must be born from above, not fallen from above, not born again. The, Hebrew, the Greek is very fixed. It's born from above, meaning that's God's plan. You've got to be born to woman innocent to make your mind up whether you're going to follow God or Satan. Omar from Illinois. Are the white Europeans some of the lost tribes of Israel? Well, God didn't lose them. They lost themselves, okay? They went north over the Caucasus Mountains, captured by the Assyrian, and later... Um, settled Europe, and then many migrated to Canada and, Canada and America, and there you have it. They're scattered everywhere. But then, that's no marvel, because God said, God promised, I'm going to scatter you to the four corners of the earth. Boy, he did a good job. Marilyn from Ohio. Who are the Kenites, and what race are they today? Well, they're a race of their own. When, when you say the word Kenites, K-E-N-I-T-E-S, it's a Hebrew word that simply means the sons of Cain, okay, or the offspring of Cain. And um, it's his children. You can trace them throughout the Bible. They're recorded and with us. Jesus taught of them even. And the, he taught of the first murderer in St. John chapter 8, verse 44. A genie from California, what does the word Shulamite mean? Shulamite means peaceful. Kind of comes from the etymology of shalom, okay? Um, Georgia from Iowa. Please explain the Old and the New Covenant. Also, where is the Ark of the Covenant and what does it symbolize? Well, uh, you, ask a, you ask me to explain both the Old and the New Testament in one question. That would take some doing, okay? The Old Covenant is not old in that respect. The new simply fulfills it. That is to say, continues it. And Christ, on dying on the cross, certainly opened that to whereby salvation was taught all the way back to the beginning, God always being fair and um, equal to all peoples. Now, the Ark of the Covenant, you will find where it is. In, by reading the last two verses of Revelation chapter 11. Father took it. He didn't leave it here on earth because man wouldn't take care of it properly. And what's in it, you can read in Hebrews chapter 9, about the first nine verses. Read it. It's still in it, and it's all there for a purpose. Um, I taught what each item was basically in this last Passover. Uh, Carolyn from Washington, it seems to me that the whole flyaway fiasco probably started with Matthew chapter 24, verses 40 and 41. Please explain the true meaning of this. Well, it, it, uh, that's not where it started, but that's part of it. It's um, where one woman is work, there are two women working in the field and one's taken and one isn't. Now, to study God's word, you have to follow the subject. And what is the subject of Matthew 24? God is warning us of the coming of the Antichrist. And the Antichrist takes the first woman out of the field. She's the apostate. And uh, certainly... She flies away all right. She flies right into Satan's bed to disgrace and a wicked, wicked path. And uh, that's the meaning of 
Matthew 24, 40, and 41. Uh, you can back up from there just a little bit where it says it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah, and it, it, which aligns with the question just prior to this about the fallen angels mating with Adam's children, daughters. Jesus teaches in Matthew 24 that it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. They're going to be giving and taking in marriage again. What? To Satan and his fallen angels. Because as it is written in Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, Satan and his angels are physically de facto going to be kicked out on this earth. They're coming. But that's all right. We've got power over them, so we don't have anything to worry about. But woe to those that are ignorant of God's word. That's sad. Yolanda from Indiana. Do you think that someone can commit murder intentionally and be forgiven? Um, I am concerned because I heard a serial killer was saved and confessed Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior before he was killed himself or executed, I suppose. I was asked to Read Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 50. Love your program. Well, that wouldn't help you on that. That's not God's law. Um, if he were to lie in wait, now there makes a difference, okay? If someone takes a life in a crime of passion, that means, in a crime of passion, that means they have pushed the buttons that throw out of control the law of jealousy and many other things that enter into this. And a person isn't as responsible for their own actions as perhaps they should be. This is why to judge God's law, you have to know both sides and you have to know each person. That's why God is the judge. Okay, But if one willingly takes another life, it, he can repent if he wants to. And he can be tried on earth all he wants to, but his main trial is going to be with the father and the one he murdered. Okay, They're there. They're waiting. Caroline from California. Why do people say not to ask God for patience? They say it opens doors for the devil to send all kinds of attacks. Uh, you know, I really, I really don't know where people get things like this because you can ask, you can talk to God about anything. You could ask, if, if you need patience, by all means, ask God to help you with it. Okay. God himself, as it is written, is long-suffering. Uh, St. Peter, the, the, the second book of Peter, chapter 3, what is it, verse 7 and 8. God is, has, um, is long-suffering, meaning he's got all kinds of patience. But don't, don't ever have someone tell you, you can't talk to our Father. If you have a problem, he wants to hear it. Okay. It is not written anywhere that when, when Jesus Christ, when he gave up the ghost on that cross, he rent that veil to the Holy of Holies from top to bottom. And you can boldly go right on the end and say, Father, I need more patience if you have a trouble with it. There, it, it if, if patience... Um, uh, and short of patience, might, you might cause you to tend to allow Satan to trick you a little bit, but asking God for it doesn't have anything to do with it. Impatience can lead to anger or many other frustrations. But if you need more patience, talk to him. You know, Father loves you, and you can talk to him about anything in the world and ask help with it if you can't handle it. Or or let him know that you love him enough, you're going to try it on your own to change or whatever. But if you need something, ask him for the ability to do it. He loves you and he wants to help you, okay? Fred from Arizona. I, I really, you know, this is why would-be preachers can get people in trouble. This is why would-be so-called Christians can get people in trouble. Because they absolutely handcuff the living God. They let Ezekiel chapter 13 verses 18 through 20 come to pass where God says, you women, that so, which has no gender, you sew kerchiefs and place them over my outreach saving arms where people can't see it and teach them to fly to save their souls. I'm against it, he says. So, 
Don't, don't let somebody handcuff God. Don't put up with it. Fred from Arizona. Were there only spiritual bodies on earth in the first earth age, and was it Satan and his followers? Well, he was there, but uh, he, they weren't the only ones, okay? Only a third of the people followed him in the first earth age. Um, what, what is Satan's role with the earth? I heard only a portion of a comment that you made and thought you said he ruled the earth. Well, he's his spirit right now is the prince of darkness, but he doesn't rule unless you let him. Okay. Because in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, we have power over all of our enemies. So don't, don't let Satan get any grip on you because uh, his evil spirit is here, but we have power over it. I was baptized at an early age and was baptized again when I joined my wife's church. Is my soul lost for having been baptized twice? Of course not. You know. God, God loves his children. And, and um, God is not looking for a child to zap each day. And he understands how people, uh, I, I'll say it, God doesn't wink necessarily at ignorance, but he does understand when one doesn't know. Melody from Ohio. Is it all right to put a price on God's word, and is it all right for a preacher to put a price on their knowledge of God? No. You can't put a price on the knowledge of God. But now, let's be careful here, okay? Because at the same time, a servant, if a preacher is a servant of God, Every servant is worthy of his hire, but he cannot charge for the knowledge of God. And, um, but let, let's say that if you ask some material that has part of the knowledge of God on it, you should pay for the material, but not the knowledge of God. Okay, I, I hope that you understand what I'm saying. Um, just because I choose not to take a salary for teaching God's word, doesn't mean that a minister or a teacher of the word does not have the right to, to take a salary. They certainly do. I just choose not to because I, like to, I enjoy making my own way. Okay? And, and that's just an agreement between me and the Father. But um, at the same time, I, you can't take that away. Every, everybody must, uh, every servant is worthy of his hire, okay? But you can't charge for God's word again. Bovell from North Carolina. Why did Jesus need to identify Christ with when he betrayed? Why did Judas rather? I'm sorry. Why did Judas need to identify Christ when he betrayed him? They all knew him in Matthew 26, verse 55. Well, it was dark. Have you, have you ever been out in the boonies on a real pitch dark night? And he was paid 30 pieces of silver to betray him. First off, they didn't know where he was. They, they, they knew him when they saw him, but they didn't know where he was. Judas did. And for 30 pieces of silver, Judas not only led them to him, where, where they led them to where he was, but then gave him the kiss of death uh, as he approached to identify him and collected his 30 pieces of silver. Um, Sh Sheila from California. I'm afraid I have a stupid question. What, what event ended the first earth age? Well, that's, that's not a bad question. Uh, the rebellion of Satan and a third of God's children following him he was supposed to be protecting the mercy seat and he fought over it. And that caused God to have to sentence him to death and to destroy that first earth age. And instead of destroying Satan and the children, he destroyed the age and brought this age of salvation in so that hopefully a third of those that were Satan followers, we can get straightened out. Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, John from Florida, I thought that the word him in John 3.16 stood for Jesus rather than the Father. 
However, I came across a similar statement in Romans 4, 24, 25 that more clearly implies the him to be father rather than Jesus. John, think for a moment what you're saying and think about the scripture. What did God say to call Jesus? Him. What did he say to call Emmanuel, God with us? There's only one Him. If you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Okay. Uh, Lee from Georgia. Pastor Murray, I really enjoy hearing your teaching. Well, thank you. And I wish I was closer to Arkansas. Well, great. In Ezekiel, where it talks about the burning wheels of light, could they have been spaceships or UFOs? They were, they were ships because God's altar was aboard it. Okay. It was right there on it and in it, and certainly they were vehicles. But the Hebrew is very specific. In verse 4 where it says amber, the color amber, that word in the Hebrew is highly polished bronze vehicles. I'm out of time. Hey, you know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. You like to hear the teachers that God has sent us, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, uh, Daniel, and so forth. You like that word, but most of all, it makes God's day when you study that word, and he loves you for it, too. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, when you bless God, you know what? He's always going to bless you. Um, that's, that's the way he operates. He loves you. Now, most important, though, hey, you listen to me carefully. You stay in his word every day. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Open your Bible and let's go to class with Dr. Murray for a better understanding of our Father's Word. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this recap on the book of Revelation. Most asked questions on the book of Revelation. This, uh, I hope you've en enjoyed this as much as I have doing it. The question we came up to that we would handle in this particular lecture is explain blood up to the horse's bridles. And we ask a word of wisdom from our Father that we may understand this great book of Revelation in Jesus' precious name, amen, amen. Yeshua is good to us in as much as he uses symbology, so naturally uh, we cannot visualize a city with blood for 200 furlongs 